let me begin with uh, definitions phenomena. Uh, see, active matter, this is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, as you will see, so it's okay to write here, right? In a certain sense, uh, active matter, although it started as a way to write down theories of flocks and self-propelled things, ultimately is just another name for uh, collections of particles homogeneously driven out of equilibrium. Okay, uh, and in that sense. Many could even argue that, look, you know, why do you call it a separate subject uh, at all? But anyway, I'll try to convince you there's some value in uh, looking at it as a distinct subject. Um, so the, um, I mean, obviously the reason why we want to study active matter is that uh, living matter is active. And by active, what I mean is simply that you know you have a collection of objects. These could be swimming organisms, or they could be us, or they could be components inside a cell, whatever it is. Each one is driven, you know, you've got a collection of objects. These are the particles of your system. And rather than driving it, let's say, by applying a shear to the boundaries of the container, or by making them all settle under gravity or something, these things are driven at the scale of each particle. So, driven at the scale of the constituent particles. The particles themselves need to be real, you know, maybe need to be particles, they could be fairly extended objects, uh, but that's the basic idea. So, what that means is, that if you don't know anything else about the system, you can view it as a collection of particles executing a dynamics liberated from the constraint liberated from time reversal invariance. I should also add that when I say time reversal, I don't mean in the sense that there is a magnetic field or something present. I mean that these things are driven. There is a sort of arrow of time driving these systems at the level of each of the component degrees of freedom. Obviously, you know, when you have a collection of living organisms, as long as you keep them perpetually supplied with fuel, you can think of these as a collection of particles doing whatever dynamics they can in this way. Okay. Um, and uh, just to give you, a, draw a contrast, let me give you a a set of cartoons of different non-equilibrium systems, okay? So this is a fluid so this is not what I would call an active system. The reason is the forcing is being applied from one end, you're pushing fluid through it. The internal the degrees of freedom in here are getting their energy indirectly. So I would say this is not an active system. I have a collection of, so, you know, um, shear flow is not a good case. Um, sedimentation. You have a collection of particles all settling under gravity, and as they settle through the fluid, they interact with each other, and they do interesting things. But in this system, again, it's true that every degree of freedom is directly driven, but it's being driven by an external body force. This is not like swimmers. This is a system with an external force. So I wouldn't call that active matter. I, obviously, a large part of this definition is a purely social, sociological or psychological thing. You're welcome to study these as your favorite non-equilibrium systems. Um, but so collections of objects that are swimming, yes. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that once you take the idea that you're driving these things at the level of the constituent degrees of freedom, you can cook up quite silly active systems, which will still obey the kinds of laws that emerge from the equations I'm going to write down. For example, uh, if, I take, if I take this table, okay, and I place a bunch of objects on it, and I subject this table to vertical vibration, Okay? And I have objects lying on this table. And these objects have some structural asymmetry that makes them start walking around. They will. 
Okay? That collection of particles, if you then don't worry about the fact that you are pumping energy in a third direction, if you look at just the two-dimensional world of this table, the laws governing the collective dynamics of particles in that two-dimensional world are active matter. So, so you have a surface like this. You vibrate this surface up and down. And you have little objects on this. Let's say these are objects which have a head and a tail. They'll start walking around. Or maybe objects that don't even have a head and a tail. And you have a collection of these things on this surface. If you write down equations of motion to describe what this system does, uh, they will end up falling into the, uh, one of the categories that are, whose equations I'm going to invent uh, in a little while. And therefore, by extension, you could even take something more exotic. You could, instead of this being a table that you're vibrating, it could be, let us say, a two-dimensional electron gas. Okay? And you hit it with noisy microwaves. And you can ask about the uh, steady state into which the uh, ca charge carriers in the system uh, settle down. And those steady states have, in fact, been described using equations which belong to the broad family of flocking models. So, um, you know, sort of quantum active matter. And there's, there's actually a nice paper whose reference I can give you if you want, which uses flocking models to understand the so-called zero resistance states in these systems. And these are just states which are at the edge of spontaneously setting up currents. And the laws that set up those spontaneous currents are not very different from those in flocking models. So that's just to tell you that this definition is broad enough to encompass quite a wide family of systems. And some of the most uh, convenient realizations of such systems may not be in living systems. They may be in these funny vibrated systems. Uh, and just to give one last example before I go on to um, uh, before I go on to setting up a specific problem and solving it, uh, you can also make artificial self-propelled systems by many means. Obviously, every motor vehicle or aircraft or whatever is an example. But a much sillier example is you take an object, let us say a colloidal sphere. And you coat part of it with some catalyst. Okay? And in the medium, you have some particles of species, which I'll call A. And a particle of species A comes in, makes contact with this catalytic patch, and then goes out as B. And let's say uh, that's a downhill uh, chemical reaction. So you go. Is that the right sign? I don't remember. Whichever it is. Whichever the sign is for downhill chemical reaction. So B is a lower free energy state than A. So let's say you know, this, you've got a particle here. You've got a medium containing objects, which I'm calling A, which are in a high free energy state, but metastable. So left to themselves, unmolested, they'll stick around forever. But if they make contact with this catalyst, they release energy. And this thing starts swimming. This becomes self-propelled. So you can create physical, chemical realizations of active systems. And again, these systems, just like we are active only as long as you feed us and we die if you don't, these things will keep moving as long as you go on supplying more and more of A and find some way. Again, you know, in running our societies, we have to find ways of getting more of this and we have to find ways of getting rid of this, right? And so these are also examples that are very nice experiments done on this class of systems uh, as realizations of active. OK, uh, so yes, in this, so in this case, for example, uh, if you have an object that has some structural asymmetry, like here, this is a colloid on which some clever uh, chemist has patched a piece of a bit of platinum. That object then, I, I will not have time in these lectures to discuss this class of particles. The way they propel themselves is by creating uh, osmotic gradients along their surface. That osmotic gradient, let's say, you know, imagine, for instance, a particle of A is a, a big particle, and it, each A breaks into two little particles, for example. Okay. So then what you'll have is along the surface, you'll have a composition gradient, and uh, you'll get fluid flow along the surface 
as a result of this gradient, because there'll be more A here than there, more B here than there. And, as a, and so this thing behaves like an organism with little cilia on its surface. No, not, there's no cilia, there's just these little particles. It sets up a flow along its surface, and it squirms along through the fluid. Uh, the direction of motion in this case, in the simplest case where these things are just hard spheres, let's say a big hard sphere disintegrates into very small ones, what will happen is that you have more of these hard, these, these hard spheres here. So if you've got more of these guys here and less here, which way will, if they're just hard spheres, which way will fluid flow be along the surface? Which way, towards these guys or away from these guys? Speak up, I can't hear you. Towards these guys, right? Because it's an, it's an osmotic flow, it'll, try, it'll go to dilute this stuff. So you'll get a flow like this, and this guy will move like that. But if these particles are more complicated, let's say they have an attractive interaction with the surface, then you can alter the direction. But this kind of thing would take me too far afield from the general statistical mechanics of active matter. So I don't think I'll be able to give uh, to lecture on this. I was not planning. Yes. Exactly. The point is, uh, the contrast I was trying to make is in this case, we are applying, in this, this I would say is not active. You've got a pipe or a channel and you are pumping energy in the boundary. Okay. It's a three-dimensional system and you are pumping energy through the two-dimensional boundary. Here the idea is the entire medium is full of uh, reactant, which is the fuel. So every single particle gets this energy input direct. It's basically like having, like, it's like being in a nutrient bath or in, you know, carrying your lunchbox and eating whenever you like. So your supply of fuel is at hand. If you have a three-dimensional system and you are feeding energy from out there, then the dynamics in here is not usefully described in the framework that I'm going to talk about. That's the only thing. I mean, actually, frankly, even in these systems, in practice, what happens if you have a 3D system? Since we don't have access to dimensions, to spatial dimensions beyond three, we have no way of directly feeding the interior of the system. So, in practice, unless you have a, a thin film geometry, you know, really, in practice, the way you would make a system like this work is you'd have some two-dimensional slab of, you know, this is where the the medium will be, and you will. As fuel is exhausted, you would find some way of taking waste out, and you would find some way of flowing fuel in. So in practice, any time you actually want to maintain a steady state, you do have to find a way of shipping material in, shipping material out, which is why when the trucks go on strike, uh, a city is in trouble, right? Because nutrient isn't manufactured everywhere homogeneously. So it's, it's the same thing. It's no different. Okay. Um, so that's all I, that, enough of generality. Uh, what I want to do is the following. I want to now, as quickly as possible, I want to come to a specific example. Okay. And uh, let me first give you a very oversimplified specific example before I come to general framework. Let's start with, uh, let's start with the Langevin equation. It's always a good place to start. Let's see how you will modify it from what you already know to include self-propulsion. Okay. So, and let's, for the time being, let's keep it fairly general. Let's keep position and momentum. And you have X and P are position and momentum. And normally, what would you say? You'd say that You're all familiar with this kind of equation, where that's noise. And this is some external uh, potential in which the particle is confined. Now, supposing you want to describe a particle of this sort, which, rather than just doing Brownian motion in a potential, wants to drive itself. How would you do it? Well, uh, excuse me. Uh, the way would be to include some propulsive force here. Now, again, there's more than one way of doing it. Supposing this is a particle, let's take a sort of funny example. Think of one dimension, and let's say you have an object of some size. Uh, I'm sure I can draw this very well. Um, 
I want to start with a particle which has no particular asymmetry and acquires an asymmetry. Supposing it's a particle which, if it is tilted like this, starts uh, walking like this. Okay, so the idea is this. You've got, I mean, first of all, let me just say, you've got a particle with some structure which is such that under some circumstances, I haven't said what the propulsion is, it starts spontaneously locomoting in one direction. Okay. There are many ways of doing that. You can imagine purely mechanical versions. You know, you've got a surface and you have a particle which could land like this or could land like this. Supposing both sides are the same, but supposing once it lands like this, it gets stuck in this state. Then it will keep bouncing and walking, bouncing and walking and keep going in one direction for quite a while. If it landed like this, you, you can make mechanical realizations of this sort. Whatever it is, my claim is I could produce such a realization by saying that what happens is that the state of zero velocity gets unstable and the state with non-zero velocity sets in by saying that I'll get a term, let me write this as mv dot this gamma v. So you have some machinery, which I'm not specifying, which if this coefficient is positive and large enough, will overcome damping. This is propulsion. And then, you know, it's, it's not like it's going to speed up arbitrarily. If you go give it more and more fuel, it won't go arbitrarily fast. It has an internal controller. So you have something like this. And if you like, you can add noise to it. So at the single particle level, and purely phenomenologically, I'm not giving you a mechanism, here is the simplest model of a particle which spontaneously enters a state of propulsion. Now, obviously, if it's a single particle and there's noise, um, which direction it moves in uh, won't be permanent. It might start moving in one direction, but eventually uh, you, you can't, you know, a single particle can't spontaneously break symmetry and start moving forever. But here's the simplest model. Sorry, Abhishek is looking worried. You have a question. Uh, actually, you can feel free to start. Yes. So if you write it as a derivative of a potential, if you write it as a derivative of a potential, OK, I should emphasize, if you want to talk about self-propulsion, you want a mechanism which the particle carries with it. A particle can't, can't really carry the gradient of a potential with it. OK. You'd like to add something? Yeah, right. Yeah, in general. I mean, you can do you something that resembles the derivative of potential can emerge. For example, in ratchet models, I will not talk about ratchet models, but uh, if you, you know that if you have a potential like this, then even though on a macroscopic scale there is no gradient, if you have the particle sitting in two possible states, in one of which it sees the potential and one of which it doesn't, for example, then the effective potential, after you integrate over this internal degree of freedom, can acquire a tilt. I mean, ultimately, if you want propulsion to come out of a Langevin equation, uh, the particle has to move, and uh, so some force has to emerge. I'm just saying there's various ways of doing it. You could do it like this, in a description where you're actually keeping track of inertia, or you could do it like this, in a model without inertia. I will, as I said, I decided I wouldn't talk about ratchet models because they've been re reviewed a lot. But uh, these are models in which you have a one-dimensional, non-centrosymmetric periodic potential. This is a non-centrosymmetric periodic potential. And then you can have different kinds of models. You can have so-called flashing ratchet models, or you can have some internal state models in which you occupy the two states uh, not with the relative populations governed by temperature and so forth, and then you can get a net drift velocity. There's more than one realization. But in all of these, if you want to call it self-propulsion, after all, if you want to transport material, let's say, through the human body, it's not done by applying a macroscopic electric field across us or a gravitational field. We don't even swallow by gravity. We swallow by peristalsis. You can eat standing, standing on your head, right? Um, so. In any case, so I just wanted to give one example of how you could, yes. Yeah, yeah. In general, all that, I, all that we really mean in our hearts for active matter is 
systems in which detail balance is broken at the level of the microscopic glaze broken. Okay, absolutely. And in those systems, clearly, if you break detail balance, then if you have a vectorial asymmetry somewhere, chances are, with overwhelmingly high probability, you will get a current in the direction of that. Uh, and you can have two kinds of questions of interest. One is, what is the mechanism that breaks it in particular instances? The other is, assume you've got a system of this sort, what are the coarse-grained laws, macroscopic laws, both of which are these. Are, this would be an example of a microscopic mechanism leading to it. Uh, or you could say, I'm going to write down equations in general governed by, uh, governed by laws that spoil detail balance. And I'll actually show you something that's in between. I'll show you, yes. Third term in. I'm sorry, my handwriting is. I was trying to write big and still I wrote indistinctly. Just, no, the idea is that, you know, if alpha becomes bigger than gamma, then clearly the state V equals zero is unstable. Clearly what will happen with this problem will be that. If you look at this, you have a, if you look at, let's forget about U prime of X at the moment. Just, if you look at force versus velocity, then If, you, if alpha was zero, you have something like this, right? This is if alpha equals zero. Then you have forces minus gamma v. Let's forget this also. Let me move this to the right-hand side. Okay. If alpha is zero, you have this. If alpha is equal to, and you have this, of course. So you have something. As you increase alpha, you get this, eventually you get this, and then eventually you get this. This is for alpha greater than gamma, right? In this state, this becomes, so for this case, V equals zero is an unstable fixed point, and V equals whatever this is. Uh, And the system will happily start moving in either of those directions. Right? And you, you want to put in a V cube because, you know, physically it's unreasonable that uh, if you just go on supply, uh, supplying more and more fuel to your car, it'll uh, go faster and faster. It doesn't really work that way. Okay. So I'm just saying you have to, this is a purely phenomenological description in which I include a term beta V cube so that my velocity doesn't run away. If it were not for, if it weren't for this, dv over dt would be a positive number into v. So my system would accelerate forever. So you need something. So this is just, this is not a theory. This is a post fact. This is, a, this is a, an imagined, this is a post facto description of an imagined phenomenon, if you really want. Sorry. I don't know what else to call it. Okay. Uh, uh, no, I don't know. I don't do V squared because no time reversal symmetry is not broken by that. I, I V and V cube because uh, I didn't want to pick out plus V over minus V. You could of course do V times mod V. No, no law preventing it. I just wanted to write down equations that while being invariant under V going to minus V could still do this. And also because when we write down coarse grain flocking models, we'll use uh, terms of that sort. Uh, and we'll see, okay, so we'll see that. Okay. Now, most of my own working life has been in writing down coarse, not single particle descriptions of anything, but coarse grained or what are called hydrodynamic approaches. Now, obviously, if you have a single particle system, that's not that's meaningless, okay? But our interest is, again, let me tell you what our interest really is. My main interest is not to understand phenomena of this sort, but to, under, but to take systems of particles in which 
at the single particle level, you have a velocity or some tend some align some some shape and isotropy or something. And I would like to understand ordered phases of active matter. So, for example, supposing I see a collection of objects with some shape, all moving more or less in the same direction. Maybe on a surface or maybe in a bulk fluid. Okay, so you see an object like this. Okay. What I'd like to do is just as, you know, if you gave me any, let us say for the time being, given my uh, training, if you give me any classical system with some inner state of order, with a little bit of work on very general grounds, without knowing anything about the microscopics of the system, I will be able to write down for you uh, a coarse-grained hydrodynamic equation for this system. Okay? If you give me a simple fluid, if you give me a liquid crystal with any kind of symmetry, if you give me a crystal, if you give me a superfluid, you name it, uh, folks in our trade know how to write down the equations of motion, really with almost no information from microscopics. And we would like to do the same kind of thing coarse grain hydrodynamic approaches to describe ordered phases for active systems. Okay, so that's the mission. And uh, the way we do it is one, you pick the variables, okay, two, if your system so let's first revise how we do it for systems at thermal equilibrium. Okay. Am I still writing big enough? I have no serious doubt that I'm talking loudly enough, but am I writing large enough? So you pick, you identify the variables of interest. I'll tell you how you do that. I'll tell you what all allowed terms means. You include the fast degrees of freedom as a noise. And four, You implement a principle that more than one previous lecturer has alluded to. Okay? And if you do this, you actually have equations of motion that are guaranteed to be correct at long wavelengths and long times. But I haven't told you what many of these pieces mean. What do I mean by slow variables? Uh, you can take two, of, two points of view about this. You can say, in an ideal case, you look only at those variables whose characteristic time scales of relaxation or evolution go to infinity as that's one thing okay what do i mean by that why do i why are these sort of sacred the reason these are sacred is that if you have an infinitely large system, and we are always interested in infinitely large systems, then no matter um, how long you wait, there will be some variables which have not finished relaxing. Okay? And therefore, if you want the theory of the slowest degrees of freedom, 
these are the only things you have to keep. Anything whose time scale approaches a finite value, even if that value is large, has the property that if you coarse grain, if you go to big enough scales, you can forget that variable. It's like Tridip was saying, you know, you may have some correlation in the system. You coarse grain above that correlation, that length scale or time scale is treated as zero. So you don't do that. That's one. Uh, but of course, we'll discuss under what circumstances this happens. Broadly, there are just, you know, you could say three situations where this happens. One is, local densities of conserved quantities. The other is um, the order parameter near, or strictly speaking, at And the third is what are called broken symmetry. Variables. And what do I mean by that? Let's, let's discuss each of these in turn. The first, you know that if you have any process, Suppose you have a conserved quantity, and suppose that conserved quantity's dynamics is local, okay? So you have some region. So let's talk about, let's say this is A, this is B, this is C. Let's do it. Suppose you have particles, and supposing they're just doing a random walk, okay? So... Brownian particles, just as an example. And you look at the number density. Let rho of x t equal the number density. Then because the particles are neither allowed to evaporate nor create more copies of themselves in the interior, you know that if this is some region R, then integral of rho over the region R is a constant. And that means that rho changes. So, you know, if you like here. So the rate of change of the integral of rho over that region is only due to entry or exit through the boundaries. some flux dotted into the outward normal over the boundary of that region, which I can rewrite as an integral of the divergence of this guy over the region, right? And that means and that means that the rate of change of Let's Fourier transform in space. So I'm Fourier transforming rho and the current in space. And this goes to zero as q goes to zero, which is just another way of saying that if the total number, which is the zeroth Fourier component, is constant, modes with Fourier component with wave vector q relax, evolve more and more slowly as Q gets smaller and smaller. Unless something funny and singular is happening to J, okay? Yes. Yeah, same R. Now it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now it's okay, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so what I've done is, without any detail, I've argued that on things, unless the current has some weird properties, the rate at which these spatial variations in rho evolve in time has to get slower and slower as you go to longer and longer length scales. Because if you go to infinite length scales, you've got all the particles and it doesn't change at all. 
that's one. So this is dealt with. And this, by the way, is why the equations of fluid dynamics are written in terms of the variables they are written in terms of. You write an equation for the density, the momentum density, the energy density, often rewritten as density, velocity, and temperature fields. But it's because of the conservation of uh, mass, momentum, and energy that that's done. So it's no surprise that those equations are written that way. OK, uh, so now let me go back over there. I can use this board, right? Okay, so let's do B. Um, the order parameter. So let's take a simple model. Let's take a very, very simple picture of an order parameter. Uh, let's say you have some scalar, just as an example. And you have already seen in earlier lectures in this course that uh, the ordering can be viewed in a very, very, in a mean field sense. And let's say this order parameter is phi, and this is some effective potential V of phi. And as you change some control parameter, say temperature, V of phi changes from being like this to being rather flat to eventually being like this. So this, this guy in here, this ultra flat guy, is for T equals C. And you know. And I, you saw in uh, Uwe's uh, lectures that relaxation at the critical point is slow because the restoring force to a perturbation at linear order vanishes in the limit of a uniform, spatially uniform perturbation. So you saw, and uh, Uwe would have written down equations like this. So here you could say, nonlinear terms, which I won't worry about, okay? So as A goes to zero, let's say this A, let me write this as okay. Then the relaxation time at, so a little bit better. This means that well, I need better organization here. I still write, I guess I'll go here. And this means that the relaxation rate so at the critical point where this coefficient is zero, the zero wave number mode doesn't relax to a linear approximation. And so the second criterion for when that's just one example, you have to keep a certain variable has been illustrated there. The third, and now let me come over here. Let's say you have a system. Let's forget about flocking. Let's say these are little, little vectors of some sort, which have some kind of interaction such that below a certain temperature, they all condense into an ordered phase where everybody's pointing the same way. Now, the point is these guys, so let me, these guys could have picked any direction to con con condense into. This way, this way, this way, this way. So this or that or that. You can globally rotate everything, and the system absolutely doesn't know it's been rotated. And what that means is that in this case, if I describe the uh, reference state by something pointing this way, and supposing I perturb every, I turn everybody through an angle theta. If theta is spatially uniform. There's no restoring torque. So that means 
A global change in the orientation suffers no restoring torque, and that means its relaxation time, again, is infinity. And therefore, if you have something And therefore, if you have something where, you know, things are pointing If the variation in the orientation is large, the restoring torque, restoring force or whatever, goes to zero as the wavelength of the disturbance goes to infinity. So this is the third kind of variable for which there's no, for which relaxation at long wavelengths will be slow. Okay? Huh? This is C, yeah. So that basically, you know, except for weird things that I won't get into, that basically covers the three broad possibilities which give rise to uh, especially slow relaxation. In addition, however, when you're doing actual modeling of a physical system, it may just turn out that over the time scales of your observations, some relaxation time is big enough that you have to include it. And then you're starting to do very crude modeling, and I'd like to stay away from that. So for the purpose of these lectures, we'll think in terms of always having really well-defined slow variables, you know, variables which are defined as slow by a very precise criteria. We can't always stick to that sort of puristic principle, but we'll try. Okay? So now we know how to identify slow variables. Yes? You can call it that. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not just the point is you're, you could, the system could always be infinite. Okay? So, at the moment, the way I would like to work is I'll always consider my systems are absolutely large, are unboundedly large. And what I control is the length scale at which I'm examining the system. The reason is I don't want to deal with boundaries. Okay? So I want to deal with systems for which, uh, in some sense, they're always so big that you can forget where they begin and where they end, and I'll deal with the interior of the system. That's also more or less, you know, normally when you're doing um, statistical mechanics, it's true that whenever you take a real physical system or when you simulate it, these things are finite, but the... the you try to draw conclusions from statistical mechanics that apply to thermodynamic systems. So in that sense, assume there's no walls, assume there's no boundaries. Whenever there is a finite size, I'll tell you. Okay, so Q here represents the more, the 2 pi over the wavelength I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. It's going to be like, it's going to be exactly like that for a liquid crystal. The reason is the symmetry that's broken is broken in space. So I'll come, I'll describe a specific model. I'll actually, uh, I'll come to, that's a, that's a, it's actually an important question because you can have, you can imagine systems uh, which aren't active but have an orientation. Uh, and those systems also order. And those systems, so strict, Strictly speaking, you should keep an orientation variable, which is invariant under time reversal, and a velocity which carries the burden of breaking of time reversal. But uh, both of these aren't independent slow variables. So strictly speaking, you can always relax the one to the other and write down the equations. But we'll get there eventually. Um, unfortunately, there are some people in this audience who've heard talks by me for many years and are probably heartily sick of seeing this particular introduction because it's remained largely unchanged for many decades. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm actually hampered by the fact that I can't read my own notes uh, without my glasses, and I can't read the board with my glasses. So, <laughs> this is, it's pretty bad. Um, yeah. So, what have I, I, I've done? Identifying variables. Now, I want to write down all allowed terms. What on earth does that mean? What that means is that I, because I'm choosing a coarse grain description, I want directly to write down continuum partial differential equations for these systems.
So again, let me take a concrete example. OK, supposing my variable is the classical xy model. What do I mean? I've got the underlying system is a lattice, at each side of which I have a vector s. I have an interaction. So I'm right now again back to equilibrium. Okay. I and J label the lattice sites. At each side, I have a rotor with this described by an angle theta. At each side, I cosine theta. I, sine theta i, this is my Hamiltonian. Okay. What I want to do is to write down the simplest dynamics that relaxes to thermal equilibrium with this energy function. Okay. And let me, I'm going to take the following point of view. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll use this example to tell you what I mean by coarse graining, therefore, how to build the equations of motion, uh, and then uh, what I mean how these guys, if they are actually birds or fish or something, are different from these guys. So let me use this for all three. So I will directly coarse grain. And when I coarse grain, what happens is the underlying variables, which are unit length vectors, if I now say that here's my lattice, and I take a large number of lattice sites, I take a number of lattice sites that's much, much bigger than one and much, much smaller than all of them. Okay? And when I do that, Trust me, I'm allowed to instead write down an, effect, uh, an effective free energy functional of, uh, I think uh, Uwe used S, so I'll use S, of this form. I'm unfortunately deviating from my notes. Yeah, because it's lost the subscript i. This is now s of uh, position r, position x, let's say, and y. Okay. I didn't tell you how this is related to the microscopic one. So I just built it. Now, you can do this. OK. Uh, I don't know if uh, Abhishek or Sanjeev talked about this in the introductory lectures. Uh, I mean, but for example, supposing you take the Ising model, and uh, explicitly do Curie-Weiss, Bragg-Williams, whatever it is, you can build the effective free energy function. By very simple, similar arguments, you can do this for this case also. I'm not doing it. So what I'm saying is now that this S is no longer constrained to be unit length. It's just a two-component vector. Obviously, uh, descriptions of this sort are best near onset and not globally, all that, but I'm saying that these caveats apply to XY, to Ising, to Heisenberg, any of them. Yeah. You don't have to do an RG, really. You just have to... So, I mean, recall how you do it for... Uh, recall, recall, recall Bragg-Williams theory for Ising model, right? What you do is... I mean, there's many ways of doing it, but uh, this actually belongs in the tutorial. Maybe we can discuss it in the tutorial. Basically, Imagine building first the purely local part of the free energy by doing a quick and dirty mean field estimate of the energy, a simple estimate of the entropy, say, ask for the entropy associated with the given. So the mean field energy is just going to be minus Jm squared, or J over 2m squared in the Ising problem. And then there's going to be uh, minus Ds. So Calculate, given a magnetization M, how many ways can you have that 
and you take the log of that, and you get this. Uh, my, is my sign right? Yes, sir. No, 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 but I think at the end of it, this must be a plus, right? Uh, what I, whatever it is that gives me a plus m squared over 2 here, okay? And then you say, look, I'm going to do a little bit more than that. I'm going to allow m to vary slowly in space. And then the same exchange coupling that gave me this, expanded to the next site, will also give me something like some coefficient that depends on the lattice thing times j over 2 grad m squared. Okay, if you allow me to go, you know, to say I'm going to coarse grain such that I've got a lattice spacing, I'm looking at this scale, I can do this. I can do a similar thing for this and get this. Okay, so that's the, the way of doing it. I don't know if, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want the tutorials to be mainly about equilibrium and stat mech. I want to come from, go from this to that reasonably soon. Let's see how it goes. Okay, I'm also not sticking to the order I promised in my outline, but, uh, these things more or less commute. All right. So then what my claim is that all I really need to do is to do what Uwe said, which is write down generalized Langevin equation for S. So I'll say this del S over del T. There's no conservation law. I didn't tell you there was any conservation law. S doesn't, there's no such thing as S commuting the total Hamiltonian, none of that. So I'll have simple model A type dynamics. Some kinetic coefficient. So I'm, you, I'm taking advantage of the fact that Uwe has already been liberally using this very description to say that if my, steady, my, equi, if my system is a thermal equilibrium at some temperature T, then if I want the system to relax to a state in which the magnetization profile is distributed as the probability of giving, getting a given magnetization field If I want this, then if I write down this Langevin equation, that is guaranteed. Roughly speaking, you can see why, but even in more detail, you can see why. S is just some sort of a coordinate wandering in a, a landscape with a potential energy function F. Okay? This is like, it's no, not significantly different from a particle with no inertia, moving at a velocity proportional to the force it feels at temperature T. So this system will relax to this. Okay? There's no, but the model has no physical reason for having a conservation law. It's not 3D Heisenberg, it's 2D, it's a planar magnet. So there's nothing, there's no commutation. If I had, if it was Ising, then I could worry that if the Ising variable isn't a spin, but actually an occupancy variable by a particle, so if it's a lattice gas, then I'd be entitled to worry about conserved versus non-conserved uh, Ising. I don't know of good physical reasons to consider conserved X, Y, but I have no doubt that it's been considered somewhere in the literature because people are ergodic. Okay. And uh, so this is the model. Now, the, I can rub this ideology slide out. So what I meant by all allowed terms is the following. I didn't really write down all allowed terms here. I wrote down, first of all, in this functional itself, I wrote down kind of a minimal set of allowed terms. What did I do? I kept this term. Why did I keep this term? I didn't have to, but if A becomes negative, which is what will produce order, then I had better keep this term, otherwise my energy function will be unbounded below. I can get lower and lower and lower F by making A larger and larger. The other is that even if I do this, there's nothing to tell me that, see, this thing says, what does this thing, these two say? Supposing A is less than zero. implies F is minimized by right? But anywhere it can point, here's a whole circle's worth of directions. It can point there, 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 anywhere. Let's call this S naught, okay? Anywhere with length S naught. You need something in the model physically to prevent S from pointing in completely arbitrary directions at adjacent sites. This is the minimum way of, minimal way of doing that. So what you do is you sort of, some principle of uh, parsimony or economy is what you use to say that, look, this is all I need. If, the, if I do an experiment and find that my system is entering a modulated state, 
then I know that this is a system in which somewhere in parameter space C has gone negative. If C goes negative, I had better include something with even more derivatives in it. Okay? But as long as C is positive, then I know that at long enough wavelengths, I don't have to worry about this term. You understand? So the approach you take is an approach of sort of being economical, of minimality, even in the continuum theory. Okay? So that justifies this. So what I mean, therefore, by writing down all allowed terms is, in principle, I should just put dot, 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 dot. And all those dot, 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 dots cons consist of terms that I do not have to worry about if I look at large enough length scales. Because if I put down a del squared as whole squared, I know that the ratio of the coefficient, let's say I put down such a term. Then I know the ratio of k to c is a length squared. And in the absence of any very special phenomena, that length scale must be a length scale related to the lattice spacing of the system. We are looking at scales much bigger than the lattice spacing, so we don't worry about those. Which one? Langevin equation? I mean, yeah. This, is, yeah. This, uh, I mean, again, you know, I did, we didn't derive this by perhaps in the introductory lectures you guys said something about it. You know that if you're trying to minimize this, this is the lowest, the simplest level for doing it. You could worry about, should I worry about spin inertia? Answer is, I don't know. But given that the spins are moving in a medium, there's clearly going to be a dissipative torque. So, you know, supposing I said there's some I S double dot term. Hmm. Then I know for sure that this term is also allowed. And therefore, I know that at long length scales, this will win. Long time scales, this will win. There are situations where that doesn't happen. When you've got a conservation law, the reason that uh, you, you know, so in this models, you can't get waves at long wavelengths. So you could do, as I said, at each stage, you only keep what you need to keep for the longest length and longest time scales. Then you're always safe. Okay, this relation, see, first of all, I could, as again, we were saying, I could always write this down without a coefficient here. I just call it A. And then I'll say the temperature of this model is A over twice comma or whatever it is. Instead, I'm choosing to write it this way in anticipation. I, I, as I said, I could just do this. I could say there's just something called root 2A. And the temperature in that case has to be A over comma. And what I mean by that is if I take this model and look at the Fokker-Planck equation, it will relax to a stationary state of this form from which I can identify this. And of course, strictly speaking, yeah, so I mean, in principle I can do, I, know, I, I won't have the time to do linear response theory and all that, otherwise I could tell you the degree to which you can figure out uh, the for, the restoring forces when you, up, I mean, response to applied to forces as distinct from statistics spontaneous fluctuation. I'm assuming at some level that is covered in introductory lectures. I don't know. Yes, no? Well, I mean, but you know, you can't do everything. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is the minimal model for planar spin classical stochastic dynamics. In principle, you can derive this by starting with something that's actually prescribed for microscopics, namely starting from the quantum dynamics of uh, full three component spins introducing a hard axis or an easy plane, and then you will find that all the nice properties of the Heisenberg dynamics go away, and you're left with this rather mundane dynamics instead. But, so you can, in that sense, derive it. So that's what I mean by writing on all allowed terms. You stop at the level you need. And I've already dealt with the fast variables. I've already introduced the noise. Uh, I would, you know, for those of you who don't know about uh, where Langevin equations come from. People often write down Langevin equations by confident assertion. Okay? Uh, there are two ways to convince yourselves that uh, for thermal equilibrium systems, Langevin equations are in the form of the Langevin equation is inevitable. One is Mori and Swansig. I don't remember the references, but if you look at there's a very nice book by Swansig. Uh, this starts from a microcanonical system. So it says, supposing I've got a complicated enough microcanonical system, isolated system, an isolated system complicated enough that it thermalizes, and it thermalizes for reasons of the sort that Shubhrato told you about. So this course is great. Every bit is covered in some stage. 
And then you say, I'll take a subset of those variables. I'll call those the system. So for example, I, the simplest case is supposing I've got a fluid with particles. Okay, these are colloidal particles. So the colloidal particles are sort of, you know, bigger than a molecule, but smaller than a mustard seed. And you've got water in between. And supposing you say, I'm going to look at the dynamics of the colloidal particles alone. I'm going to take a very simple-minded view of it. I'll ignore all the funny sloshing hydrodynamics of the water. I'll just treat the medium as some kind of bath. I'll ask, what are the effective equations of motion for the colloidal particles? Okay? The claim is those effective equations of motion will be Langevin equations. More generally, you, you know, so in this case, notice that the subsystem and the bath are in intimate contact. It's not like there is a big bath and here there is a subsystem. I mean, here there's a big total system. Here there's a subsystem, here there's a bath. Everywhere there are subsystem particles, everywhere there are bath particles. The separation is in length scale and not in uh, position space. The separation in some sense is in wave vector. So you can do that. You can, for any such system, you can go through a formal procedure of going from the full microcanonical description to uh, the description for the subsystem. Okay? You've seen that for the static properties. A similar and much more hairy process is available for the dynamics. That's one way of doing it. But a very nice way of doing it is, I will not have time, maybe I'll do this in a tutorial, even though it doesn't belong in this course. A very nice way of doing it is, to take one particle with mass m, position x and momentum p, coupled to a bunch of other particles with masses little m, positions x, i, and momenta p, i, all these guys. And let's say these springs are linear springs, OK? You can calculate the effective dynamics of x and p with nothing more than the physics you learned probably in your first year as an undergraduate. Okay? And then assume you don't prove thermalization. You assume everything is thermally distributed at p equals 0. Why? Because you're just solving Newton's laws. You're solving Hamilton's equations. Okay? Uh, and because all these springs are linear, you can solve exactly for the dynamics of this guy in terms of the initial conditions. You then have to assume the initial conditions are thermal. Once you do that, something basically with the form of Langevin equation comes out. And exactly in what sense it comes out, uh, I won't specify here. You can look it up. There's a book by Zwanzig with, with, I think, which is probably called non-equilibrium statistical mechanics or something like that, even though it's mainly about systems at equilibrium. Uh, there's also a book which maybe is easier to get hold of by Jayanto Bhattacharji. And it also has a very confusing name. I think it's called, actually, look up all the books that Jayanto has written up and find which one has this. I think this is with Bhattacharji. I think, it's, I think it might even be by Bhattacharji and Bhattacharya. OK, uh, this is done. And but as I said, this is a completely element. This is not a derivation or a proof, but it makes very plausible this general form, okay? including the relation between the noise statistics and the damping. The reason the noise and the damping are related is simply that it's the same agency doing both of them. If you are just sitting there in a medium where particles are bombarding you, you get kicked around at random. If instead of sitting there at random, uh, sitting there blindly, if you try to move in some direction, you get hit more by, on this side than on that side. That is the reason for the relation between this and that. That's all. But you can see this. So um, I will go on. What's my what's the time? There's no clock. No, there's a clock here. So I have 20, 19 minutes left. Okay, that's fine. Yes. So what I want to do, OK, let me just do one thing. You can, uh, there's, uh, I, I would just go read it. There's a lot. I mean, the, you, you assume you get the, 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 the resulting properties of the noise and the damping, the correlations of the noise and the memory of the damping 
depend on the spectrum or on the density of energy. Uh, okay. And this is actually known to most condensed matter physicists as the, cl the classical limit of the Caldera Leggett model. But this actually, I'm pretty sure Zwanzig is was way earlier, but in a classical context. Okay, uh, what I want, okay, I've told you what I'm going to fast variables, and this model is already constrained by detail balance because I've written dynamics at thermal equilibrium. So now, maybe in the remaining 20 minutes, yeah, I think what I'll do is not formalism. I'll very quickly show you what happens when you have a system of this sort. What do I mean a system of that sort? What I mean is that these S's are now vectors. First, there's two differences, okay? So now, I want to talk about the active case. Active XY is also known as the toner 2 model. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually deviating a lot from my outline, but it's like, okay. S. You know, in, in the standard rendering renditions of XY or Heisenberg model, you think of this in the simplest cases, the it's a vector pointing in some internal space. It's really a vector pointing in real space. Second. It's not on a fixed lattice. There's no lattice, okay? Third, actually, I should say more. S is a vector in real space. There are particles. It's not just a bunch of spins. Therefore, the, why, why am I mentioning there are particles? I'm introducing an additional slow variable, the number density of particles. Here, the only slow variable I had was the order parameter. Right? Now I've got a S and I've got a density of particles. So let's see what happens. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, and let's, let's assume that these particles, let's assume, let's simplify hugely. Let's not even worry about the particles diffusing. Let's just assume the only thing the particles do is move with a velocity proportional to s. Okay? So, let's start with the third one. My claim, therefore, is in the third one. So, let, I have to introduce, therefore, a number density. And I'm going to write down a continuity equation for that number density. What's the current of these particles? It's rho times s. Okay? I'm assuming the velocity is 1. The speed is 1, okay? So this is the easy equation. The second part of the story is that I can just go over here, save myself some work by erasing many things. First of all, as I said, if I forget about this, the fact that I've introduced a density means I should now, and the fact that S is a vector in space, means that I can now add other terms to this. Right? If S is pointing in a certain way, I'm certainly allowed to say that, you know, if I define a local vectorial asymmetry there, that will tell me it will have some preferences to whether it likes to have more particles that side or more particles this side. No reason why not. Therefore, a term of this sort is allowed. Right? Plus some you know, terms involving rho, grad rho, etc. 
which I won't specify right now. I'll just say that I have to write down even if s is not a velocity, if s is a vector pointing in some direction in space, if this is, as they say, a compressible magnet, for example. Supposing I've got a bunch of a magnet on a, on a structure whose density can change. If I squeeze things locally, they can align better. If I push them apart, they can align worse. So this and this and this, everything should depend on rho in principle. Right? In addition, yes? Let's not even think of moving. I'm saying, supposing you just look at this part. Stay at equilibrium right now. Don't even become active. Even then, if I've got a vector pointing that way, if I've got a, you know, sort of a polar liquid crystal, if I've got a magnet whose coupling between spin and space degrees of freedom needs to be taken into account, then if I have things pointing in a certain direction, that couples them to the density in a very natural way. Because I, can't, I have to make a scalar. Otherwise, I, you know, those other couplings are here. Couplings just to the uniform part of the density are here. The simplest bilinear I can write down in S and rho is S dot grad rho, or equivalently rho div S. Up to integrate by parts, those two are the same thing. Right? So if I were doing a kind of linear theory of this, I'd need this term as the lowest order uh, quadratic term I can have in these guys. I can't do anything lower. Same thing, it's if you integrate by parts, integration over all space, s dot grad rho and rho div s are the same thing. So that's not a new term. Um, and then I'll have some, you know, free energy for rho and its gradients, uh, which I could write down to the desired degree of uh, refinement that I wanted. And this would be what I'd get if I just worried about this. Next, I say the particles move around, okay? Then I could write down a description in which I have diffusion, okay? L squared rho, or you know, things of that sort. But let me simplify my life. Let me jump straight to the active case now and say, that, look, I won't even worry about this del squared term. I'll introduce it if I need to, and you'll find that I don't. Let me keep track of the fact that not only do the particles move around, let me insist that the particles, that S is the velocity field of the particles. I could do something more complicated, but this is good enough for most purposes. Okay? So now what will happen is, does anything change here? First of all, it's very clear that this del F over del S will acquire, for example, a term from here. So this will contain So this term, you can, if you think of S as some kind of polarization vector, then this is some kind of term that says that a local gradient produces torques the local S. If I think of S as a velocity, then this is kind of like a pressure, pressure gradient term. Doesn't matter which you think of it as, such a term is allowed. But that's by no means all. You've already seen that if S is a velocity, this happens. In addition, if S is a velocity, then a state where S is globally non-zero is a moving state. And now, supposing on top of that moving state, there's some spatial variations. That moving state will carry those spatial variations. So I have to allow for some terms where S advects itself. Why? Basically, imagine I've got a state where everything is pointing like this on average, but there's locally some disturbance like this. This disturbance will get carried, not necessarily at the same speed, just as if you're in traffic, you know, you're sort of slowly moving forward and density disturbances and, and other disturbances are slowly moving towards you. The, 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 disturb the speeds of all disturbances aren't necessarily the same, but certainly you'll get a term like this. Okay, and uh, there are other features um, which I will not bother at, for the purposes of today's lecture. Uh, what I want to do is to look at the model in this form, okay? So let's expand this out. Yeah. It is, but it, it is not obliged to have coefficient unity. It's not obliged to have coefficient unity. The reason, not only that, see, the thing, there's no momentum conservation here. You're on a substrate. So first of all, you're kind of liberated from Galilean variance arguments. And uh, the real truth of why, and that's, that's a half truth, the real truth may be offline. Yeah? 
this year. The two places where you're really seriously in non-equilibrium are here and here. If you thought of this S not as a spin in a magnet, but as sort of some, you know, imagine a bunch of rotors with a point in the front and a fat end. Those are time reversal invariant objects. They're just pointing somewhere. This and this are taking seriously into account that this, if there is a local alignment pointing that way, that's a local velocity. It's just saying that these guys are motile organisms. They have a front and a back. Not, they not only have a front and a back, they know which way to go. And if they're pointing in a certain way, they're going in that direction. And uh, so let's now just quickly write down the other terms. You'll get some minus a s minus u s dot s times s and you know plus whatever c uh, i've absorbed the kinetic coefficient of these i'm sorry del squared s um, and you could get more complicated terms but basically look at what you have you have something very funny looking if you didn't look at s dot grad s and you didn't look at this and you didn't look at the density equation at all it's the equations of an xy magnet on the other hand, if you didn't look at S and S dot grad, uh, S dot S, you know, if you didn't look at these terms, your DS over DT, you have an S dot grad S, you have a del squared S, and you have a grad rho. It looks like fluid mechanics. So there's a shotgun wedding of, uh, uh, you know, XY spins and uh, Navier Stokes. Yes. It is not one, there's the reason, the, the really detailed reason for it is complicated. But I can, I'll take a legalistic uh, shelter behind the idea that, look, this is a system on some substrate. So anyway, I'm not obliged to respect Galilean invariance. That's actually, that's actually a misleading answer, but it's misleading for reasons that will take us very far afield if I go into it today. Okay, so, and there are two other terms. which I will not worry about, because what, what, you can ha what can happen is, in your energy function itself, in your, you know, in whatever, in, even in the equilibrium limit, you could have uh, this term. Yeah, first of all, instead of S dot grad rho, you could have S dot grad, it's, this is a very technical side remark, uh, F can contain, terms of the form s dot grad some general function of s dot s and rho. Why? Because it's allowed, right? I want to write down some simple scalar. So I can get terms like gradient of s squared. That is, the pressure can get a separate contribution that you don't get in fluid mechanics, proportional to the velocity squared. And A can depend not only on rho, but also on del dot s, and on higher powers and all that. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that this term, this, this system is the symmetry of this system. This system is not invariant under s going to minus s. I mean, s and minus s are not the same thing, right? Therefore, your effective free energy function, even in the equilibrium limit, is allowed to have terms that break s going to minus s symmetry. So if you have a del dot s times s dot s, if you vary this, you will get you can get uh, s times del dot s, right? If you vary this, s dot s times del dot s, and you can get grad of s dot s. So these are three there's this guy and these two guys. These two guys can occur even in the equilibrium limit. These two guys can arise as variational derivatives of a scalar function. This guy cannot. If these two guys arise as variational derivatives of a scalar functional, their coefficients are related. Absolutely not. That's, that's very important. Yeah. So, so what we're going to do is say we are now out of equilibrium, we're active. 
liberated from detail balance, we start writing down what we please. So I want to do it this way to show you how most people with, you know, who learned what I learned at my mother's knee um, write these equations. But there's a more grown-up way of doing it, which is kind of to derive it. I'll, I'll do that in the next lecture. I didn't want to go first into the formalism of derivation. This is the way, this is the way Toner and Two wrote down their equations. Next, in a couple of lectures, I'll show you how we wrote down our equations for these kinds of active systems in a fluid. In the second lecture, however, I'll give you a framework within which the appearance of terms not allowed at equilibrium becomes understandable. Okay, but right now what I want to do in the remaining three minutes is just quickly try to look at some consequences. So right now I've just thrown a whole bunch of terms at you. The only reason that these terms are interesting is that they, it's not that they change some local dynamics, not that they you know, introduce some minor disturbances into an otherwise Navier-Stokes-like or otherwise XY model-like dynamics, they totally change it. The long wavelength, low frequency behavior, long wave, long time behavior of this system in the ordered phase is wildly different from that of either an equilibrium XY model or an equilibrium fluid. That's why it's interesting. It gives you a flocking transition. That's not surprising because this part already gave you that. But the properties of as the, of the spontaneously broken symmetry state known as the flock are totally different from the properties either of a simple fluid or of an x y uh, You get long range order in two dimensions, for example. True long range order in two dimensions, I will give you two arguments for that uh, in later lectures. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. So it's. So there are lots of ways. I mean, even the, even the linearized mode structure is different. Um, there are lots of, so let's, let, I don't know how, uh, I think the best way to do it is to say that, let's look at the order. Remember, let's, if you look at this part, then for A less than zero, you know that the, the steady state is, has mod S equal to, And rho equal to some value, rho naught, let's say. Okay. And now let's perturb it. Let's say, let's say it orders, pick some direction, call it the x direction, plus delta s. And let's think in two dimensions. So um, many of you must have seen models like this. You know there is an underlying potential for this part of the dynamics which looks like this rotated around that, right? And you know that this radius is S0. And you know there's two kinds of movements, up and down these, uh, the walls of the trough or around the bottom of the trough. Movement around the bottom of the trough, if done globally in this, with the same phase, uh, has no restoring force, okay? And it gets a cost from gradients. So what you find is, therefore, that if you write your S, as uh, S naught times um, cosine theta, sine theta, then you know that in the, in the XY model, if it is just equilibrium XY, you would get theta dot, yeah, yeah, equals C del squared. I'm sorry, I swallowed a kinetic coefficient everywhere. Okay, there should be a gamma A here, a gamma U here, a gamma C. This is what you'd get in the equilibrium case. And that's, uh, you can call them spin waves, but they're not waves. It's just uh, diffusion of the angle variable. What happens here is very, very different. And the way to see that is this term comes in, that's one piece, and this term comes in. How does it come in? Well, let's quickly write down what the equations look like, and then we can go home. I didn't actually tell you about noise. That'll have to wait till the next lecture. So what will happen is, what happens to the density equation? You find that d rho over dt. Remember the reference state is s pointing along x. That's 
one place. And the other, I'll perturb uh, S and keep row fixed. So the perturbation, so when you've got something that's pointing on average along X, on average along X, and you perturb it slightly, then the, it's the Y component that's of order theta, and the X component is of order theta squared. Perturbation is the X component. So delta S is approximately 0, comma theta. OK? And so what you get here to linear order in perturbations, the perturbations, remember, we said are theta is small. Theta is 0 is the reference state. So the density equation becomes del rho over del t looks like this. The order parameter equation somewhere becomes this piece and this piece. So what, are the, what is this piece? It's now we're no longer in equilibrium. So I'm at the moment neglecting del squares. We can come back to it next time. So what do you have? What you have is theta gets carried at a speed lambda s0 squared. Theta perturbations travel advectively this way. They couple to the density in this way. And let me just put dot, dot, dot. Okay. So I'll, I'll close just by telling you what you get for Let me do something a little shady. Let me pretend that this coefficient is 1. I have a, that's a minus sign here. Let me pretend that lambda is 1, s0 is 1. OK, and let me move into the uh, shift into the frame co-moving with this wave, Okay, just for simplicity. move so you shift into the frame moving with that speed and then what you have is delta rho dot is rho zero del y theta and delta theta dot I mean theta dot is Assuming my signs are right, I'm sure I've screwed up on a sign somewhere. Um, no, it's fine. It should be fine. It means that theta double dot is. Uh, yes? Hmm? Tell me, well, what, what did I get wrong? Yes? Where is the density equation? Yeah, yeah, it's a minus sign in the second term, which is why I'm OK. Thank you. So is whatever, you know. So you have modes with dispersion relation, frequency squared. So these are modes 
So, you know, remember what you have, you have a system that's moving along like this on average, and you disturb it locally and waves travel like that, right? The wave vector, the propagation vector of these waves is along y. So you've got a flock moving like this, and you disturb it, and apart from the fact there's some kinematic thing going, along, going on along the direction of motion, you have disturbances moving laterally. This happens neither in an XY model nor in an ordinary fluid. These waves, even though these waves came about through the coupling of a density to a velocity, these are unrelated to the sound waves through which you are hearing me, because they happen because theta, because of a spontaneously broken symmetry. So the mode structure in this spontaneously broken, this symmetry broken state is a... So I'm going to miss my bus, right? No, it's a few minutes. Yeah. So I just wanted to give you... So the point is, this has not been an exercise in statistical mechanics in a certain sense. We started from a microscopic picture. We said we coarse grain, we take slow variables. Finally, I've given you a coarse grain PDE. But you know that one of the jobs of statistical mechanics is to build hydrodynamics and to build thermodynamics. If you like, that is the exercise we've done. We've built the hydrodynamic description by starting from a microscopic description with some kind of rules. I didn't tell you the microscopic rules. The next couple of lectures, I'll also tell you how you build the coarse grained equations from microscopics in detail. So what we've succeeded in doing is using the kinds of principles that we know to work for equilibrium systems, abandoning the constraints that thermal equilibrium imposed on us, and looking at the general consequences in one famous case, the donut rule. And I'll stop there. I'll answer questions for another three minutes, if you like, but I should catch my shuttle. Hmm? It's 2, it's 4.04. What's the 4.15, I think? So I should be okay. So are there questions? I'll add. So what I can say about the noise is, if you write down the equation for the density in just this form, there's no question of a noise. If you include a diffusion and a noise, you can do that. You can include diffusion and a noise. Yeah. And in this, the additive non-conserving noise that we added is the obvious thing to add. You can add that, and you get very interesting consequences in the presence of the noise. But right now, what we've done is we've identified the easy excitations. Uh, those easy excitations are going to have a big effect when there's noise, because they're easy to excite. Easy to excite and slow to decay. So we'll find that there amplitude in steady state because of noise is big. We'll find the, correlation, the resulting correlations decay slowly. And then, strangely enough, we'll find that um, the, the very fact that the amplitude of those fluctuations is big, which is what kills order in the XY model, ultimately rescues order in this model through the fact that the order parameter is not just an angle, but uh, is not just a vector, but a velocity. And because what happens basically is you've got a bunch of things moving like this. Orientational fluctuation should destroy order. But because if something is pointing the wrong way, a few seconds later, it's left this region. But unlike a spin, which will disrupt things, the transverse fluctuations which travel as these waves, a given region with uh, spins pointing, as, with vector, these velocities pointing in a certain way, kind of is self-purifying. Because if there's a disturbance, that disturbance is not just a disturbance in an orientation, it's a disturbance in how these things are moving. And therefore, if a bunch, some guys are not pointing the same way, five seconds later, they're not in this region anymore. That turns out through a... So I can give you two clean analytical arguments to actually give you a long-range order in two dimensions in this system. No, and the reason you don't is the symmetry that you break in one dimension in this model is a discrete symmetry. So there is... Uh, the first paper, actually, Vichek and company's paper makes incorrect statements about uh, what happens in one dimension. I mean, incorrect, I mean, they're sort of slightly confused statements. Uh, there's a huge difference between one and two dimension because the character of the order parameter in one and two dimensions is different. It's an Ising-like order parameter in one dimension, XY-like in two, Heisenberg-like in three. Because the number of components the order parameter is the dimension itself. So everything changes. And so you have long-range order in two and many other sort of cool facts. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah. So you can do that. That fluctuation in the magnitude, as with any of these problems where you order, you know, you order in, if you condense an ordered phase through a spontaneous breaking of symmetry, the amplitude, uh, if you look at this potential, you can see that changing the amplitude is costly. There is a restoring force for changes in the amplitude, even if it is spatially uniform in space. 
and therefore variation fluctuations in the amplitude are a fast variable i will assign a problem which we will discuss in a tutorial where you will see why you can always forget the amplitude fluctuations except near the phase transition yes yes They want, the disturbances will travel. So consider a uniform ordered state and now disturb it slightly. Those disturbances travel laterally. I told you the point is because the magnitude fluctuations are like this, you will have fluctuations. Those fluctuations will relax locally. On short, time, short length scales, you might get some range over which they're propagated, but they'll basically be diffusive. And I will give you an assignment to do this. That's the right answer. And I mean, it's a good question. The only way really to see it is by doing it. I can tell you, but unless I painfully repeat the algebra on the blackboard, which is more painful for me than for you, I'd rather you did it, which is more pain, less painful for me than for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, you know, it's tricky. Uh, uh, the whole topological defect story in these systems is very strange. At some level, it's right, they interact logarithmically. Um, but, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. There is, yeah, so I don't know about a dislocation, defect unbinding theory of the melting of these systems. Don't actually know. I'll tell you something that's much stranger that happens in the apolar case. These, uh, I'll come up with these. So there isn't, I, uh, there, basically this is still a work in progress and we actually don't know. Yeah. Answer? sir? Huh. I just chose, I said let's set lambda and S0 to 1 and then you've got waves moving with speed 1. Let me shift into that reference frame. I change reference frame so that this part and this part of the dynamics, I've just co-moved with it. So I'm in the frame moving with it. So actually, if you shift back to the lab frame, the dispersion relation gets more complicated. You can, it's not that, not that hard to work out, but I just avoided that trouble. I, I didn't neglect it. I shifted it away by choosing parameter values. And so on. 